Jesus here. Good afternoon. Great to join you this afternoon. And um, it's going to be my pleasure to talk to you about the impact of renewal, renewables on our electrical grid. And my hat's off to the Heartland for putting on this great conference. Amen. All right, there we go. Our world today is beset by climate regulations. A recent study by the Grantham Institute found almost 500 climate regulations across 66 nations. Many nations have carbon trading or carbon taxes. Many have feed-in tariffs, laws to uh, promote biofuels, laws to reduce energy demand. And those laws have produced a number of bizarre outcomes. Let's take the case of Denmark. Whoop. Denmark has uh, erected over 5,000 wind turbine towers, the highest density in the world, one for every 1,000 citizens. On the left, I've plotted all the wind turbine fields in the nation of Denmark from the Danish Energy Agency. So today you have a terrific view of a 300 to 500 foot high wind turbine tower from every field, every beach, every hill, all over the nation. Now you'd think that 5,000 wind turbine towers would put out a lot of electricity, but you'd be wrong. <laughs> they put out all in total an average of 1.2 gigawatts. They could all be replaced by a single conventional power plant that would take up the area of about one of those black dots. And Denmark today has the highest electricity rates in the developed world, about 40 cents a kilowatt hour, three times the United States rate. In Germany, we have a bizarre coal boom. Germany has been the shining green light of climate uh, fighting for many, many years. But now, they're building more than a dozen coal-fired power plants. And this is not just because they've closed their nuclear facilities. But I have to disagree with uh, my friend Howard here. They're shutting down gas-fired power plants in Germany because they're not profitable. And the reason is that wind and solar have first priority on output. Gas is only run part of the time, so they can't make any money with the gas plants. So they're shutting them down. And coal imports by Europe from the United States have gone up by a factor of 10 since 2002. Now, when Thomas Edison built the first electrical plant at Pearl Street in 1882, he chose coal, not wood, because wood was an inferior fuel for electrical power. But today we have the bizarre situation of the Drax power plant in the UK. It's the biggest power plant in Europe, putting out almost four gigawatts of electricity. But because UK and European community climate laws don't count carbon dioxide emitted by, from burning wood, and we all know it emits about twice as much as coal, they're converting the plant to wood. And because they don't have enough wood in the UK, they're shipping it 3,000 miles from the United States. <laughs> They've converted half the plant at a 700 million pound cost. The UK government is paying a billion pounds for this, uh, in subsidies for this conversion. And the citizens of Britain are going to enjoy double the electricity cost. And then we have the bizarre situation uh, right from Tiffany's state of California. Whoop, got to get that going there. Earlier this year, the California Valley Solar Ranch went into operation in South California. And this ranch covers a whopping 1,500 acres, but it produces only 55 megawatts of power, only 10% of the output of a, a uh, gas-fired plant. 1.4 billion in federal and California subsidies and when it's all done, produces electricity at a price of 15 to 18 cents per kilowatt hour, five times the California wholesale rate. So 100 times the land area of a gas-fired plant, 10% of the output, and three times the price. What a bargain for consumers. <laughs> okay, roll that one, please. 
So if somebody wants to build a coal power plant, they can. Oh, you it's missed. just that it will bankrupt okay, them because right. they're going to be charged a huge sum for all that uh, greenhouse gas that's being emitted. So if somebody wants to build a coal power plant, they can. It's just that it will bankrupt them because they're going to be charged a huge sum for all that uh, greenhouse gas that's being emitted. Well, we got it so twice. If somebody Whoop. wants to build a coal power plant, they can. <laughs> it's just that. It bears repeating. <laughs> repeating. Why am I not advancing here? Oh, we got to. We got to. Are you going to put me back on there? All right, we'll zip through this here. Well, the United States has the finest electrical grid in the world. Very good reliability, half the electricity price of Europe. But although we're not seeing a lot of bankruptcies, we are degrading our electrical grid in three big ways. First, coal-fired power is under attack, as you've heard repeatedly in this conference. Uh, in 2013, we got about 40% of our electricity from coal. But EPA regulations, including the mercury and air toxics ru rule, the uh, cooling water rule, and new rules just last month on greenhouse gas emissions are forcing the closure of these plants. The North American Electric Reliability Corporation predicted that 63 uh, gigawatts of power would be closed, and that was just from the first two rules. That's before the piling on of the climate rule last month. So what's happening, the first big impact on our grid is our electrical grid margin is shrinking, and that means the possibility of blackouts. And indeed, the U.S. grid is at the limit. Just this last winter, we almost lost it. Across the central U.S., Pennsylvania to Illinois, we almost had blackouts in zero temperature. And when we have blackouts, people die in those kind of temperatures. Many uh, interconnection companies experienced all-time peak winter loads. Uh, Nicholas Aiken, CEO of American Electric Power, said, this country did not just dodge a bullet, we dodged a cannonball. This was in congressional testimony in April. He went on to point out that uh, they're closing coal plants in the next two years, and they needed 89% of the output of those plants to keep from going into blackouts this last winter. So if, you think, uh, if you've been thinking about that uh, gas-fired backup generator, maybe now's a good time. And we've had a shift over the last few years uh, from uh, coal-fired power to gas-fired power. 18% gas-fired in 2005, now up to 27% uh, in 2013. This is, of course, because of low gas prices from the hydrofracturing revolution but also because EPA policies are for forcing a premature closure of U.S. plants. And there's another big impact, too. Uh, gas, we don't have the storage right now for gas to create a margin for, for peak demand. Uh, you can store coal on a, a power plant site, but not gas. So this last winter, we had skyrocketing gas prices. The spot price of natural gas went from $5 per million BTU to over $100, up a factor of 20 during the very cold days. And New England, which relies on natural gas, saw a doubling this last winter for the three months of this last winter over previous years. And to, to understand the third impact, so the second impact is increased prices. The third impact, we have to answer this question. What industry pays customers to use its product? Anybody know? It's the wind industry. Wind is paid up to 2.3 cents per kilowatt hour of production tax credit for any output, regardless of demand. And states add additional production tax credits. And uh, electricity right now is bid into a wholesale market. The wind and the solar and the uh, coal and nuclear bid into this market, and then they clear at certain prices. Well, we've had a growing uh, market clearing of negative prices, and that's because wind always bids it, because they always get paid, but it impacts the nuclear and other facilities. As a matter of fact, William Hone, Exelon Corporation, said wind is paid to run regardless of the need for the electricity generation. So the tax credit will result in many instances in negative pricing for some of the baseload operations such as the nuclear plants. So it puts a tremendous pressure on the economics of nuclear plants. 
And Exelon is warning that they're going to be closing nuclear plants in Illinois because they're no longer profitable, have not been for several years. Now, I think we do see the good news, that's the bad news. The good news is we do see a light at the end of the renewable madness tunnel. And this is coming from outside the US. A good leading indicator is the Renex index, which is the index of the, the stock index of the 30 largest renewable energy companies. Back in 2008, it was flying high, up over 1,800, when former Vice President Gore and the IPCC won the Nobel Peace Prize. It's crashed in recent years. It's down about 400. Good leading indicator of what's to come. And what's going on is that subsidies are being slashed, particularly in Europe. Uh, Feed-in tariffs are being cut. Taxes are being raised on renewables. Uh, and as a result, and this is happening in England, in Netherlands, in Belgium, in Germany, in France, in Spain, in Italy, and Greece. And as a result, renewable employment is down. Um, and the reason is that uh, the European governments just can't handle the subsidies. We're talking a couple hundred billion dollars now, a couple hundred billion pounds, billion euros even, I'll get something right there, of subsidy obligations. And so they're cutting back. And indeed, global investment in renewables has been rising 30% per year up until 2011. For the last two years, it's dropped 10%. And renewable investment was down 40% in Europe last year. Does anybody here think that a climate law can affect climate change? <laughs> Interesting exchange last fall, uh, EPA Administrator Gina McCarthy came for congressional testimony. Congressman Mike Pompeo was questioning her. And he said, basically, on your website, you have 26 indicators of climate change sea level rise, heat-related deaths, etc. He said, I like those indicators. Tell me which of those indicators, which EPA policies are actually going to approve, improve or affect those indicators. And he talked to her for five or 10 minutes and uh, asked her many different ways. And she said, they are indicators of climate change. They're not directly applicable to performance impacts of any one action. So basically, the EPA admits that their policies will not have a measurable impact on climate change. Ladies and gentlemen, if there's one thing you want to get from this conference, it is that climate change is overwhelmingly natural. Thousands of laws across hundreds of nations, all summed together, are not going to make a measurable impact on global temperatures. And with that, I look forward to your questions. <laughs>